Tonight we're going to talk about an age-old question, not a new question, an age-old one. If there is a good God, then why? Why in the world is there so much suffering? Or if God could prevent disasters, isn't he somehow still culpable, guilty of being an accomplice in this awful mess down here? And if we prayed harder or just had more faith, would we be healed or spared altogether? I have a very good friend. He's a pastor. He lost his teenage son in a terrible, extended, serious, chronic illness and finally passed away. My pastor friend finally decided to tell the church the story when it was still quite fresh. And when he finished the story... A man came up to him and said, Pastor, if you would have just had enough faith, your son wouldn't have died. How does that all fit in what seems like an increasing number of natural disasters, let alone the personal ones? They are, after all, sometimes referred to, aren't they, as acts of God? If God is indeed responsible, then it is no wonder that some people are mad at God. Look at these current statistics from the International Disaster Database that someone just just emailed me just the other day. From the year 1900, the natural disasters that were recorded were down there just minimal, just, just a few each year, up to the point that in the year 2007, There are in excess of 500 natural disasters reported. And every one of these has an impact on the lives of innocent people. Just because they often live far away doesn't minimize the horrific impact on people. People who are just like you and just like me. Look at these incredible statistics from Reuters News Service on September 12, just recently. Look at these. We'll go real quickly because there's a lot of them here. But December, starting in 1992, in Indonesia, these are talking about just earthquakes, 2,200 people died. September, 93, India, 10,000 people died. Colombia, 94, 1,000 people. And this one in Asia, 230,000 people died when the earthquake hit and then the ensuing tsunami. On down, Iran, 70 people. That a smaller one, 2007, Indonesia on down, keeps going, natural disasters. And one has to just ask the question, what next? Where next? Who next? Reuters agency headlines the September 13, 2000 news with this headline, Earth's vital signs in bad shape. Can't you say amen to that? That's an understatement. So back to our original question. Why is there so much suffering in the world? Automobile accidents, cancer, AIDS, Alzheimer's, abuse, hunger, terrorism, war. The list just goes on and on and on. Well, clear back in the Old Testament times, Job, and he had a right to ask the question, asked a version of that question that we're looking at tonight. Why, he said, do the wicked people prosper? Well, before you leave tonight, you will have a clear, a logical, and a biblical answer to that question. What if I told you tonight that pain is good? You would probably say emphatically, no way. Well, would you at least concede this? That some good can come out of pain? Out of suffering? Dr. Paul Brand, one of the world's most recognized authorities on pain and suffering, has spent much of his life among people with Hansen's disease, or as it's more commonly referred to as leprosy. Because of the mental images of people with no fingers, no toes, there is much misunderstanding of Hansen's disease. Leprosy actually causes a numbing effect, he found, which for thousands of years, people erroneously thought led to the loss of limbs. But through Dr. Brandt's research, 
it has been proven that 99% of the cases, Hansen disease only numbs the extremities. In other words, the body loses its warning system, which is pain. Now, I've personally seen the ravages of leprosy. In Africa, people with leprosy have been caught reaching into their cooking fires with their bare hands to retrieve a potato, and they feel no pain. This then results in the loss of the limbs as untreated the injuries decay. Dr. Brand treated patients who could work all day gripping a shovel with a protruding nail or who would extinguish a burning candle with their bare, numb hands. Once in India, Dr. Brand tried to open a, a rusty padlock. Try as he might, he was unable to do so. Then a small, undernourished, 10-year-old patient said, Doctor, let me try. And with a quick jab, he turned the key on the lock. Dr. Brand was amazed. How could that weak little guy turn the key when he had been unable to do it? And then Dr. Brand saw a telltale clue on the floor, blood. Upon examining the boy's finger, he reports, Dr. Brand discovered that without the sensation of pain, the boy had turned the key so hard he had cut the skin open to his bone. These everyday actions, without sophisticated pain networks, ultimately do serious damage often leading to the loss of parts of the body. So what's the lesson for us? It's obvious. It becomes simple to see that pain, as unpleasant as it is, does prevent us from destroying ourselves. Likewise, I want to suggest that in our spiritual lives, pain and suffering should serve to remind us how awful this sinful world is and that we are in a great cosmic controversy between Christ and Satan. Now, unfortunately, the devil is alive and well. The realization of that can help us to keep from destroying our spiritual lives just as certainly as pain can keep us from destroying our physical lives. So then if I or one of my loved ones suffers from some serious illness or an accident, does that mean that they are less spiritual? Absolutely not. There's a great illustration of this in Christ's ministry. John, the ninth chapter, says, Now Jesus passed by. He saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. In fact, maybe the contrary is true. Certainly the Bible is full of God's special saints and heroes, many of whom suffered tremendously. And the books of James and Peter and Hebrews all admonish Christians to be prepared for suffering. Because Job said in Job 23, it's recorded, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as what? Gold. Now, dear friends, the devil would like us to be confused with who causes suffering. And he would like us to misunderstand the value of suffering when it does occur. Paul told us in 2 Timothy 2, if we suffer we shall also reign with him. Now, if you are suffering tonight from disease, from crippling accident, blindness, loss of a loved one, remember, this is because Satan and his great cosmic controversy is going on with Jesus. And if you allow it to, this very suffering can help you build a special relationship with Jesus. And you will join his saints who have suffered throughout history, but who will ultimately be united in heaven when there will be no more pain or suffering or death. Amen? Amen.
So let's go back. Let's take just a few minutes to review. How did we get into this mess in the first place? Tonight we're going to tell you about a tremendous battle that took place in heaven. It's part of what is called the great cosmic controversy. If God is in control, why do these things happen? Why are these things so common? Where was God on September 11? Millions of people were asking. And yes, God did create a perfect world. He created mankind six days. He rested the seventh day for us to glory in his work and to praise his name. Yet there is sin and sickness and dying and suffering. Why is that? God did not want it to be like that. No, he didn't. If our thesis for this week has been God so loved, then how in the world does that all fit together? Well, in Ephesians 6 it says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. No, our fight is not against the evil, against men, but it is against evil spirits that are out there in the world. Where did they come from? The Bible tells us a story about the battle for the throne of God. It's a story of war that took place, literal, physical war, right in the heavenly kingdom. We know that heaven was the home of God, full of many spiritual beings. They're called angels. One of those angels held a position of power and authority over all the other angels. He was an angel that had a tremendous ability. The Bible tells us that he was the model of perfection. He was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Ezekiel records it this way. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. The word created is very important here because it tells us that Lucifer, the number one angel in heaven, was actually a created being. He was not a god. He was not like the other godhead. He was created just like you and me. Isaiah goes on and says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You were weakened, the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. And that was a terrible thing for him to say. When Lucifer tried to become like God, God pleaded with him to end the rebellion as a parent would plead with an errant child. God could not allow Lucifer and his followers, a third, it says, of the angels to stay in heaven. Lucifer's name was changed from Lucifer to Satan. Most everyone in the world knows who Satan is. And the Bible says in Revelation 12, 9, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. God could not destroy him immediately because all the universe would have said that God was not fair, that he didn't give Lucifer a chance to prove his point. And so he cast him down to the earth so everyone in the universe and beyond could see Satan's true character. Now God warned Adam and Eve about Satan and his ways. The Bible says when God created Adam and Eve in his image, he told them to be very careful of the evil angel because he was going to try to tempt them to do wrong. God made every provision for their success. Yet he allowed them the ultimate freedom, the freedom of choice. And in the midst of the beautiful garden stood two trees. One was called the tree of life. They ate freely of this tree. They would live forever in perfect peace, harmony and happiness. And the other tree was called the tree of knowledge and good and evil. We don't know much about these trees, except we're told in the Bible that they were real trees. And God warned Adam and Eve not to go near that second tree. Genesis 3 tells us, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. You see, Satan was hiding out in that tree of knowledge of good and evil, disguised as a serpent. Almost no one likes snakes. Now, I don't like snakes. I don't know about you. Maybe you do. I remember when, when we were starting to date, my wife, ultimately Sue, and I were, were dating that she sneaked in my dorm room one day when I was not there, and she took one of those very, very, as I recall, real-to-life-looking rubber snakes 
and she stuck it under my covers in my bed. I got to tell you, it almost cost us our relationship, if not a, <laughs> if not a, a marriage. The reason almost no one likes snakes, it goes back to the Garden of Eden where Satan took the form of a serpent and after the fall of Adam and Eve, that serpent crawled on his belly and was called a snake. But before, it was evidently very beautiful. And in that form of that beauty, he spoke to Eve. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And Eve answered him. That was her first mistake. Sometimes when we're tempted to do something wrong, we stay too close to the temptation. If we would flee the temptation, we'd be able to resist. George Eliot, 19th century writer, who was actually a woman, wrote once, the devil tempts us not. It is we who tempt him, beckoning his skill with opportunity. In other words, we set ourselves up. And so Eve mistakenly stayed there, and then she said to the serpent, as the Bible records in Genesis again, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. She repeated to Satan what God had told her. And then it goes on, the conversation. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it and your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Still, people today believe when you die, your spirit lives on. That's not what the Bible teaches. We talked about that the other night. The devil is a deceiver. Eve began to think about what he had said. She was confused. She was thinking, should I eat of the fruit or shouldn't I eat of it? She had a decision to make. And Eve reached out and took the fruit. And by disobeying God, and subsequently, then Adam did it too. Eve sinned against the Father, their creator, their friend. And it says in the Bible, immediately, Adam and Eve felt guilty and ashamed. Well, if you and I disobey God, sin enters into our heart. Adam and Eve chose to listen to Satan. They disobeyed God. From their high and holy state, they fell under the curse of sin and death. My friends, that is where sin has come from. That's where sickness comes from. That's where crippled bodies come from. That's where blindness comes from. It originated back with Lucifer in the very heart of heaven when he chose to do battle with God. And then as Satan, he tempted Adam and Eve. That's where all the heartache in all the world comes from. Tragedies are not, friends, acts of God. They are acts of Satan. Because God truly loves us, as the Bible claims, God so loves. And yes, the human race has fallen from the original plan that God intended for us. Satan has claimed us as his. Wickedness fills the earth, for we are a planet in rebellion. When Adam and Eve sinned, God had a decision to make. He loved Adam and Eve so much. Would God destroy the rebel planet? This planet that's really so small when it comes to the universe, but giant in the plan when it comes to creation. Prophet Jeremiah gives a glimpse of what God would do. Turn with me to Jeremiah. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying... Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Amen. Yes, for thousands of years, God has continued to love his children. Oh, there is pain. There is suffering. There is death. But God did not cause it. We are a part of this continuation of the great cosmic controversy. Sue and I learned firsthand about this great cosmic controversy last year. It was Friday, April 7, 2006. We had been down holding some meetings in Bolivia. I came home feeling great. Had a little cough that I figured I had picked up from speaking under the lights and going from the humidity into the air conditioning and back and forth and so when we got home, we said, let's go up and see our kids and grands 
kids in Spokane, Washington. So we jumped in the car, we went up there, and we said, hey, let's all go to a restaurant there that they like in town. I said, I'll meet you there. We'll meet you there in 30 minutes. I'm going to stop by the doctor's office and pick up a little antibiotic to get rid of this cough that seems to be hanging on. Within five hours, I was in the process of being diagnosed with what would ultimately be diagnosed as non-Hodgkin's mantle cell stage 4 lymphoma cancer. Very aggressive. I was bluntly full of cancer. We were in shock. That was a Friday. I was to be in Auburn, Washington, the other side of the state, on that Sunday morning for a big church business meeting. I was supposed to speak that morning. And since we hadn't been fully diagnosed and it wasn't our purpose for being there, we decided not to make public the diagnosis. And just before I got up to sing, the delegates sang a particular song. Nobody knew that anything was wrong. They sang this song that many of you know, I'm sure, Spirit of the Living God. So far, so good. Fall afresh on me, they sang. Still, it was okay. And then they sang, melt me. Mold me, fill me, use me. No, I didn't sing it. I stopped. I was terrified. I was not a willing sacrifice. And I composed myself and I put on a good smile and I stood up and spoke on miracles. Something I believed in then and something I believe in more now. But I can tell you, I clearly did not want to be melted and molded by the fire of adversity. Well, I'd had a very good life up until that time. Now I had to learn some new lessons. That life's challenges are part of a necessary spiritual process. That tragedy can be the gateway to triumph. Suffering, as someone said, is the fertilizer on the roots of character. David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, David said, I keep your word. And furthermore, our family began rebuking the devil in Jesus' name with those words of Joseph. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. You see, trials have a way of getting our attention, a way of humbling us, in fact, bringing us down to our knees. Very ironic that the same month's church paper titled The Gleaner had a picture on the cover of me, a confident president, with an accompanying article by the editors titled Managing the Mission. And just a few days later, I could have written a sequel from managing the mission to hospital-bound and hairless. It was a new experience for a type A administrator who just happened to be German besides <laughs> to now for the first time desperately need support from family, from coworkers, from friends around the world. And even since I've been here this week, any number of you have told me you were praying for me. And Sue and I want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And somehow, we were like Job's, we found Job's comforters too, you know. In fact, more than one occasion, we had phone calls that came to our family members to confirm that I had indeed died. And then there were those wanting sincerely, I believe, to help with their cures and their potions. Finally, we got to the point where we just had to see the humor in all of it. After all, the Bible does say, you know, a merry heart doeth good like a, a chemo or something like that. We started getting cards and emails from literally around the world. And I remember we got a whole packet of cute little cards from a group of sixth graders in California. One sixth grader wrote in his card, Dear Pastor Potzer, I'm sorry you got cancer. 
Our neighbor got cancer and died two weeks ago. <laughs> what comfort? <laughs> Job's comfort type. I got a dentist uh, friend that sent me an email. He said, hi, Jerry. Been thinking about you. Just today, my office manager's dog was diagnosed with lymphoma. It seems like this kind of news is becoming exponential. No, well, thanks a lot. The classic, however, was from a PhD friend of mine. He left a message on my answering machine. Sue and I had to listen to it twice to make sure we'd really heard it right, and we had. It said, well, Jerry, sorry about the cancer. Sounds like you're going to be visiting the pearly gates a little earlier than you expected. <laughs> so you rely. You rely on God and his word in a deeper way. And even some of those texts take on a new and beautiful and wonderful meaning. Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us. Oh, I've prayed that prayer so many times. This one, rejoice in the Lord always. Do not be anxious about anything. That was a tough one, but I tried to claim it. Cast all your fears on him because he cares for you. If you've been through something like this, you claim those texts. And then there was a command and a promise. We took it as marching orders. I wanted to desperately accept some of these. And this scripture had special significance. One of you here tonight sent it to me. This is what it says. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength that I might preach the good news in all its fullness for all to hear, and he saved me from certain death. Tonight, that's a fulfillment of that claim and that promise. And then this one that I had read many times before, but it certainly never meant the same as it did last year from the Psalms, I shall not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The facts are it can still be tough. No matter how many comforters, good or bad, no how, matter how brave you are, no matter how committed or sincere, how much you pray, how many texts you quote, it can be tough. And the treatments that I had were brutal to the point of actually even passing out. Pain, nausea. There were times when my body was literally shaking uncontrollably. And I was not trying to get through the next week or the next day or, or even the next hour. I was just trying to get through the next minute. My immune system was totally wiped out. I got E. coli. I got pneumonia. It was terrible. No getting around, no saying it any other way. At times, as athletes say, I hit the wall, physically and psychologically. I, how I remember lying in a hospital bed, remember their thinking and counting the days. 76 days I was in the hospital. And then at night, staring up the blinking red smoke detector light, watching the second hand as it would just go around and round and round, green lights on the pump blinking as the chemo cocktail slowly dripped into my, my veins, pleading with God to intervene in my behalf. Please, Lord, I would pray, give me my life back so I can serve you again. Please need me for something again. Those are wilderness experiences, friends, that are not readily forgotten. And some of you can relate. My experience, unfortunately, was not unique. Many of you have had it even worse. Heartache, sadness, sickness, shattered dreams are inevitable. When you contend with the great controversy, this cosmic conflict, friends, suffering is no respecter of persons. Furthermore, the devil is an equal opportunity destroyer. But remember, no matter 
And remember this clearly. No matter how horrific the attack by Satan can be, by the time it reaches us, it will have gone through God's filter and he will see that ultimately it will for work for our good and that of others. Amen? Amen. Amen. We have to believe that. The humble little housekeeping lady that cleaned my hospital room every day made this profound statement one time to me. She said, without a test, sir, there is no testimony. Mm. The point is, don't waste the suffering. Well, I learned through this experience that God doesn't always answer the way we want him to. One night, I was facing this demon of death, having a deeply spiritual experience. I was wrestling with God, pleading with God to intervene. Deepest struggle with God that I had ever had. My hands outstretched to the ceiling, down on the floor, pleading with God, praying, please, God, heal me instantly. Give me an extreme body makeover physically, spiritually. I'll give my testimony around the world. I'll praise your name. I'll do anything you want me to do. Just heal me. But he didn't. And some weeks later, I was impressed that God was saying to me, Jerry, no. I could heal you instantly, physically, but you see in your life, the spiritual is going to take longer. You are a work in progress. It has now become powerfully clear to me through this experience. I am not the potter. I'm just the clay. I'm not the pilot. I'm just the passenger. I am not God's consultant. I am his child. So am I thankful for this trial that I've been through? We sure have, for sure, have seen some good things come out of this trial. We believe in our case, as Joseph did when his brothers sold him into Egypt, that what was meant for evil against me, God meant it for good. And one time I actually heard Sue praying out loud, thank you God for this experience. But I haven't been able to pray, pray that prayer yet, I'll be honest with you. Maybe someday I will, later, when I get farther removed from it. But even now, I accept it as a part of God's loving plan for refining my life. Maybe someday I can say with the 17th century Puritan preacher Richard Baxter, who prayed, Oh God, I thank you for the discipline I have endured for these 58 years. Maybe someday. Well, Sue and I didn't spend a lot of time on the whys of this horrific ordeal. It was a spiritual battle we knew as well as a physical one in light of this great cosmic controversy that we're talking about. We believe like Martin Luther who once said, the true believer will crucify the why question. If we understand and have an explanation for everything, then it's not faith. One of my favorite writers had a beautiful insight when she wrote, in the future life, the mysteries that here have annoyed and disappointed us will be made plain. We shall see that our seemingly unanswered prayers and disappointed hopes have been among our greatest blessings. Wow, it takes faith to believe that. Dr. Craig Nichols was the doctor for Lance Armstrong of Tour de France frame. He's the one that I was very fortunate to have as my head doctor. Now he's become my friend there at Oregon Health Science University Hospital. And when he and his whole team of oncologists learned that my wife and I were Adventists and I was alcohol-free and tobacco-free and drug-free and prescription-free and meat-free and caffeine-free and Sue says obsessively compulsive with fitness and exercise. They were blown away. 
And even I was feeling a little bit like the bumper sticker that I saw about that time that say, said, stay fit, eat healthy, die anyway. <laughs> so some people want to know, do I still believe in the Adventist lifestyle? The professional's response to my question that I did say once, how did I get this, was that all of that had nothing to do with my getting cancer. Dr. Nichols said it was probably environmental. He told me that one out of every two, and he's a world famous oncologist, one out of every two, he says, Americans will now get cancer before they die. But they went on to say that while it didn't have anything to do with me getting it, that lifestyle would have everything to do with my getting over it. Praise the Lord. Yes, I am thankful for our Adventist health message and lifestyle. And we're even more committed to it now than we were before. Well, I'll make a much longer story much shorter, and you've already heard more than you want to. Finally, the brutal treatments came to an end. All those shots and hundreds of pills and the chemo and the transfusions, all the more that goes with cancer. And as Sue says, they took me to hell and back. And then November... 20 was a momentous day for us. The treatments had been all completed. They had run me through another battery of tests. And we had that long wait. I said to Sue, I guess it comes down to about a 10 second doctor's report. All those horrible days of treatment in vain if I still have cancer or if it's successful. I'll be cancer free. It was never my ambition to have cancer survivor on my resume, but now I desperately wanted it. We have learned experientially that his grace was indeed sufficient. He hadn't kept our boat out of the storm, but he had kept the storm out of our boat. He didn't keep the three worthies either out of the burning fire, but he kept the fire from burning the three worthies. One of the biggest miracles as we look back in this whole experience, and we still marvel at it to this day, was the peace that passes all human understanding. Amen. And so we had determined that by God's grace, to try to be like those three worthies who said, He can save us, but if not, we will serve Him anyway. Possibly the most difficult prayer to ever pray is, Not my will, but thine be done. And so we endured the interminable wait, and Dr. Nichols and his colleagues walked into that room. The moment of truth had come. Yes. I was cancer free. Praise God. He had given me my life back. Sue and I went to our car and with tears of joy we thanked God. We hurried off to celebrate with our family. They had given us so much support. I was still weak, I was still hairless. But we were going to go celebrate Thanksgiving like no Thanksgiving before. And at the end of that great celebration meal my son Darren had a surprise for me he went to the kitchen he went to the freezer he pulled out two pieces of pecan pie he knew pecan pie was my favorite dessert and he had saved two pieces from a potluck several months before and he said <laughs> I'm saving these to celebrate and eat with my eat them with my dad when God has healed him that's the best piece of pie I've ever had well, we're eternally grateful. Of course, there's no guarantees. That cancer, as any of you know that have had it, could come back any time. Or I could die in a car crash on the way home from these meetings. But I've learned a significant truth through all of this. Friends, and this is the bottom line. For the Christian, it gets better either way. Amen? Friends, whatever you're dealing with tonight, down deep inside or back home with your family, if today you're sick, sorrowing, sad, lonely, discouraged, you've lost a loved one, a close friend, soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. 
And in the meantime, I've got to just recommend to you God's peace that passes all understanding. Because life is uncertain on this earth. We should live accordingly, no question. There are no guarantees here. But for the Christian, it does get better either way. Because soon and very soon, we're going to see the King. If you have a card, either here in this auditorium or wherever you're watching tonight, I invite you to pull it out right now, and I want to just ask you a couple quick questions, very quickly. First, I know suffering is caused by the devil and was not a part of God's original plan for mankind. If you believe that, wherever you are tonight, just raise your hand. Yes, amen. We do. We see that clearly. Secondly, I believe Jesus will successfully bring this controversy to a victorious conclusion. Do you believe that? If you do, raise your hand. Yes, amen. And check the card. And then, by God's grace, I want to spend eternity with Jesus and all those who have accepted his free gift of salvation. Is that the way you feel tonight? Once again, raise your hand and check it on the card. And then, you know, you've, some of you have been going through these meetings and the Holy Spirit has been working on your heart. And if you have sensed that you need to make a recommitment, possibly you need to be baptized for the first time or again, that's not on this card, but there may be some like that. And you know God has spoken to you. You don't want to miss out. You want to have that option of it getting better either way. Just put a B beside those boxes. Or if you're out in our television audience, then just talk to one of the pastors as you leave tonight. Or if you're at home, call the nearest church that's sponsoring these meetings. Let me pray with you, and then we're going to sing a song to close this great series of how God so loved us. Won't you bow your heads? Father in heaven, tonight we want to thank you for the gift of Jesus. God, you love us so much. We thank you for the gift of choice that you gave those angels. You gave Adam and Eve, and you have given all these people since. But tonight, Lord, we intentionally want to choose you because there is nothing left in this world but sin and sickness and suffering and death. So Jesus, come into our lives. We accept you. We in honestly, sincerely desire to be yours for eternity because we know Jesus is coming back soon and very soon. Amen.